from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, I think we're ready to resume. Um, the final program this afternoon uh, deals with section 117 and 109, and the topic is uh, we'll be exploring whether current limitations on and exceptions to copyright protection adequately address issues concerning software embedded in everyday products, or whether amendments or clarifications would be useful. Um, I'd like to start with just sort of a general observation uh, from having reviewed all the comments. Uh, and while this is not a universal statement, uh, it does seem to be fairly common that many of the commenters uh, either said that no changes were warranted or needed uh, on the one hand, and other commenters said uh, that the same thing, uh, but qualified it by saying that sections 109 and 110, 117 properly construed, uh, no changes are needed. Uh, while that creates the appearance of consensus, I suspect that uh, somewhere in the middle there is uh, some level of disagreement, which uh, hopefully we'll get into uh, this afternoon. So I, I would uh, throw that off as sort of an opening question, a, a general question of uh, whether uh, changes are needed uh, or not, uh, and if so, uh, if changes are needed in the interpretation of 109 or 117, uh, what those uh, areas of, of interpretation uh, are where they would be helpful. Um, so perhaps we could start with 109, uh, if anyone would like to jump in. Jonathan? Jonathan Bant, rather. Sure. So um, I, I guess, you know, sort of like the threshold issue of, of uh, you know, properly interpreted, uh, but, you know, properly interpreted, you know, is, is, you know, if I were an Article Three judge, you know, the world would be very different, but that's, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, and and I think, uh, especially for uh, for ORI, you know, we're very focused on the the specific problem of one hundred nine A and 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 how it applies to uh, uh, software enabled products. Um, and uh, uh, it, it seems that between the 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 what is an owner um, and, uh, and and what is the proper scope of uh, interpretation of 109A and all of these contractual issues that we talked about, the fact that you could just, regardless of, of how courts interpret 109A, you could still have um, uh, contractual restrictions on transfer. Uh, you know, so, so we just think as a practical matter, the only way in... Uh, the foreseeable future to really deal with this issue, you know, and then it's, you have, with circuit splits and all the rest, is to have uh, something very short and sweet like Yoda, um, and uh, uh, that would, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't obviously solve the entire problem, but it would solve, you know, one piece of the problem. Uh, Mr. Persinowski? Uh, yes, I, I would agree uh, that Yoda is an important first step and does embody some important principles. Um, I would also agree uh, that it doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, I think um, I, I would not recommend any changes to the text of 109 or 117 relevant to uh, the particular set of questions that we're addressing Today, what I, what I do think would be useful uh, is a definition in Section 101 uh, of owner for exhaustion purposes, right? Owner of a copy as it appears in 109 and 117, uh, or a definition of transfer of copy ownership. I think that that uh, is uh, a crucial question. Uh, it is a question that courts uh, have answered in a lot of different and I think inconsistent ways over the years. Uh, I think an, a definition of ownership would uh, provide some much needed clarity, right? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, consumers uh, for the most part. How do consumers know whether they own the things that they buy, 
I don't think it's a particularly satisfying answer to tell them, well, you know, here's a dozen cases decided by the Ninth Circuit and the Federal Circuit and, uh, and the Second Circuit, and maybe you can make sense of this question. Um, it's, a, it's a really fundamental question, and so I think it deserves uh, some attention here. In terms of what that definition um, would look like, uh, you know, if it were up to me, I would have a definition uh, that, uh, that said that any time you had a transaction that was characterized by a one-time payment and perpetual possession, uh, that is a transfer of ownership, right? Um, so uh, that, I think, is, is uh, the key uh, question that, that we have to answer here with respect to 109 and uh, 117. Um, I also included uh, in my written comments uh, a couple of references to uh, the Canadian uh, and Israeli copyright acts and the way that they deal uh, with the RAM copy doctrine and uh, temporary instantiations uh, of, uh, of works, transient copying. I think there might be some benefit from clarification there uh, as well. Uh, Mr. Band mentioned the uh, you, Your Own Devices Act uh, and uh, suggested that, that would be a, a good, I think Ms. Pranowski said it was a good first step. Um, what uh, what effect or impact, if any, uh, do does anyone anticipate from if that legislation was passed? Uh, what impact would it have on uh, innovation uh, in the field of, of software for embedded uh, embedded software for devices? Mr. Kuperschmidt. So, if, if I think if the <clears throat> Yoda bill or something. Uh, potentially similar or worse uh, were to be enacted, I think it would certainly adversely affect the ability of software companies to to license, uh, the, including the manner in which these software companies license, as well as their ability to enforce these licenses. Um, as a result, it will be more challenging for them to recoup their investment they make to and to develop new software products and to uh, update existing ones. It'll be more difficult for them to widely distribute their software products to the public, uh, especially on a variety of different platforms um, that consumers enjoy today. Uh, the availability of scope and warranties, uh, scope of warranties and support services, I think, could be adversely affected as well. Um, it almost certainly would change uh, their pricing structure, certainly given the, the provisions on maintenance and support that are in the bill. Um, uh, and it could also allow competitors to get access to, um, to their software re more readily and therefore steal the software, the, uh, the underlying code, and create and sell cheap, uh, cheap imitations because they will not have the sort of R&D costs of the original software company. So on that last point, I mean, why, um, why wouldn't uh, just a regular copyright infringement lawsuit be sufficient then? I mean, it, Yoda doesn't take away the ability to bring an infringement suit. Um, so, yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's right. But like I said, it would make it easier. So I don't think you want to be in a position where uh, you've changed your business model from instead of creating and innovating to bringing infringement suits either. And so I think that's, it becomes a, a, an issue of how do, how do you police um, uh, the software and, and, and similarly, but do do you think the licenses are actually is or what are preventing that's kind of uh, theft? Um, I would I would hope to to some extent that that is the case. I mean, certainly, like I said, we'll talk about twelve oh one tomorrow, and that's that's part of it. And um, I may be uh, uh, sort of joining two bills, the Yoda bill and. Fahrenholtz, uh, another draft that he's been working on, um, which would basically take away the 1201 protections So, uh, in, in doing so. But I think certainly the combination of the two would have that effect. Uh, so can I, can I ask, sorry, just a general, which maybe uh, people, other people can address, which, is, which I've always just been curious about, but why, um, why the essential copy exemption is limited to owners of the copies and why that's not automatically. So Contu recommended that the uh, Congress adopt 
uh, a rule that you know allows you to create essential copies if you're the I think it was a lawful possessor of the copy and that was changed in Congress to be owner. I'm just wondering as just as a practical matter, what's the rationale for limiting the essential copy defense to owners of software rather than anyone who's you know has lawful possession of the software? Uh, Mr. Bergmeier, I don't know. Uh, well, I, as I look at the essential step copy doctrine as really making the most sense and doing the most useful work in the case of installing software, which doesn't happen as much anymore since people just typically just install it over the internet. But if you have a disk, I would say when you are installing, uh, you're installing from floppy disks or a CD-ROM onto a computer, well, that is a copy, right? And I think that is inarguably a new copy. And if you own that disk, then you should be able to use it by installing it on a computer. I mean, I don't think that's a particularly controversial point. And that's where I think that the essential step doctrine does the most useful work. Uh, where I have sort of trouble with it is the notion that simply using software creates a RAM copy. And using the essential step test in that context, I think, is it shouldn't be necessary to either those RAM copies should be ephemeral, uh, ephemeral and just excluded from the definition of copy or, or some other doctrine should say that the possessor in that context should not need to use, uh, need a license simply to use the software. But I think s limiting it to the lawful p owner is logical in the case of installing software because otherwise I could take software and then install it on my computer and I'm the lawful possessor. Then I lend it to my friend. My friend is the lawful possessor because he's borrowing it and he can install it in his computer and so on. So I think that limiting it to owner in that particular concept uh, context makes sense, but not in the context of RAM copies, which I need. I think needs to be more fundamentally dealt with. Can I, can I add? Sure. Um, I, I think uh, an, another point that's important here is to keep in mind that the, the owner of a copy stands in a special relationship to the work, right? The owner of a copy is someone who, uh, in the ordinary circumstance, has compensated the copyright holder for uh, that work, right? And so it makes sense to extend uh, a set of rights to owners that we don't extend certainly to the public generally, right? Owners have rights that the public at large shouldn't have. And there might be other people who are temporarily in lawful possession of a copy uh, that we don't think deserve those protections, right? So, you know, I order some software. Uh, I don't know what decade this hypothetical takes place in, but we or I order some software over the internet and it gets delivered to me by FedEx. FedEx is in lawful possession of that software. I don't think they get to make copies of it, even if they're essential to running the program, because they don't stand in that sort of relationship with the copyright holder. You know, the exhaustion uh, is is premised uh, in large part on on this idea of uh, you know the single recovery theory, where uh, you know copyright holders have been compensated, and as a result, some rights get transferred to consumers that's just not true for people who might be you know uh, like I said you know temporarily temporarily in possession or, or Bailey's or something along those lines mr. Moore uh, a couple of things um, I think I just wanted to um, associate myself with uh, Keith's remarks on software he hit all the bullets that I'd written down plus a couple more I hadn't thought of um, the, the the only thing I'd somewhat confused about is uh, we there's been some suggestion that there's a split I'm not sure exactly which cases we're talking about a s split on but if we're talking about I mean if we're talking about Krauss and Berner in our view there is simply no split and there's certainly no split that warrants a, a different application of a new newly crafted rule uh, to embedded software I mean I just I'm this is something that I am struggling with I don't I just simply don't see that so, so in, in considering, one of the things that Krauss, I think, says is that you could consider, so it says that the, that the terms of the license aren't necessarily controlling and that um, it, one of the factors I think it identifies is whether it's the software is sort of embedded in a device. I think they, they 
bring that up as one of factors. Do you think that's an appropriate factor for a court to look at in terms of determining, sort of trying to draw this line between licensing and ownership? Right. Uh, appropriate, absolutely. Right, because I mean, this goes back to the dis the exchange that we, I guess, indirectly had before about consumer expectations. There are particular industries where there will be customs practices, usage of trade, about how these goods are sold and delivered. In such cases, there is going to be a good deal of reticence, not only I think on the consumer side, but also on the judicial side, to engage in um, to to find ongoing license agreements. Uh, where they are, in fact, a fiction. Um, but there are going to be a whole lot of other cases uh, where a licensing relationship is completely appropriate. And, um, I mean, in our view, the courts have solved that problem properly, and there's no indication that they won't solve it properly going forward. Uh, Mr. Lowe. So I wanted to comment the, the issue that's come up about <clears throat> um, how innovation will be affected by, you know, Yoda or any, you know, any revisions. And I think, you know, our industry, the whole vehicle aftermarket, which is about a $350 billion industry in this country, has spawned a huge amount of innovation because of the ability to reverse engineer and the ability to work with, um, you know, to work with patent law. And patent is still available to protect you know, innovation and protect new ideas. But the sense that you can use, um, that, that we fear, is the use of copyright law to, to, to inhibit that. And I guess I brought that up before. And, um, you know, the, the issue of exhaustion once that first sale, the car owner should be the one that owns all the software, not necessarily the, you know, the idea behind the software, but the software and able to do what they want with that vehicle. And that includes be able to put on parts from that car that may not be made by the same person or company that made the car. So I think it's important that when you're looking at all this, that that, that needs to be considered as part of this equation. Uh, just to bring Section 117 into the debate here, um, Section 117 does give uh, uh, certain rights of repair and maintenance. Uh, but interestingly, the language used is, is uh, the, the key point is that you have to be the owner of the machine, which in Mr. Lowe's uh, example would be the owner of the car. Um, uh, is ownership there, uh, is, is ownership of the machine itself enough, or do we also have to worry about uh, the ownership of the programs on the machine? Uh, Mr. Band, you're already up, so go ahead. So, so uh, I'll answer that as well as the, you know the, the other questions on the table so so certainly in my view it should be <clears throat> and actually I think 117c is it's the owner of the machine or the owner or licensee of the machine at least for 117c whereas 117b I think applies to the law you know you know is the owner of the software uh, and that's part of the problem here uh, that they're different and I think to the extent of you know you're asking why with Contu, why, 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 what was the cause of the change from what Contu recommended to what Congress enacted? Uh, you know, I'm old. I'm not that old. It was it was uh, before my time uh, when the copyright software amendments were enacted in uh, 1980. But I suspect that there's a very simple answer that that the lobbyists from the large computer and software companies understood that by shifting it from lawful possessor to lawful owner that they Dramatically narrowed uh, the effectiveness of 117 because uh, by then already they were all you know you know the, already by then the, the 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 predominant model was to license software and so they realized that they could completely neuter the effectiveness of 117 by just changing a couple of words so that's that's actually pretty good lobbying um, uh, you know I wish I'd been around and had done it uh, but um, uh, it, with respect to the question about innovation. I don't think it'll, you know, a, a bill like Yoda would have any impact on innovation. I mean, right now, um, uh, sort of this this control over the uh, resale market is, is sort of like money that goes right to the bottom line. Um, a, a manufacturer knows that a product has, you know, a certain lifespan. Um, uh, they have no idea whether uh, uh, the 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 purchaser of that uh, piece of equipment is going to keep it for its entire lifespan or sell it after five years and then 
you know, someone else will use it for the remaining two or three years of, of the lifespan. But the ability to charge an extra license fee for that transaction, which you know, they wouldn't have made if, if, if it had just stayed in the possession of the first purchaser. I mean, that's just, again, money that goes right to the bottom line. I don't think it'll have any impact on innovation. The possibility of infringement, again, a bill like Yoda makes it very clear that you know, this only applies to non-infringing copies. And, and, and as, 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 uh, as, as you mentioned, that it would, it would also relate. You still have the ability to, uh, to sue for infringement. So, so as you, Yoda, just going back to sort of a point that I was making a question I had before about whether this was limited to sort of enterprise level kinds of things. Um, is it your, uh, so Yoda would extend to all of those, right? It wouldn't just be limited to consumer devices. It would, it would also extend to, you know, a $20,000, you know, rack server. Um, is yes. that right? Right. It yeah. would be, it would be because at this point when you're having, you know, it, it would apply to the, you know, to the uh, iPhone, it would apply to this, right. uh, and and again, we're talking. I mean, when you say enterprise level, I mean, you know, uh, you have a lot of government agencies. You know, this the Library of Congress, but it could also be uh, the the uh, the tree company that's uh, you know that was chopping down trees in my neighborhood yesterday. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the uh, the power saws have software in them now, and so if you want to start a one guy wants to start up his own company and buy used power saws. You know, it would allow him to, to start a new business as well. And, and and is it your so it wouldn't be necessarily limited to circumstances where there's like an inability to engage in sort of the first purchaser to engage in negotiation. I mean, let me put the put it a different way. It's to, to what extent is there kind of I mean maybe you know, maybe you don't know, is there sort of negotiation between a company purchasing a kind of you know, let's I, I know you don't like the word enterprise, but enterprise level kind of uh, you know, switch from Cisco and uh, and the first purchaser and Cisco dis like negotiating over the terms of the license. Like, how does that just never happen? Well, I, my my impression is it happens very very rarely. I mean, I imagine when the federal government is buying things from Cisco, there probably is a negotiation. But certainly, going back to you know uh, when when uh, and this does date me, but when I was working on uh, Usita, uh, uh, the the. You know, the, the understanding was that you even you had these large insurance companies, and when they were dealing with the software vendors, you know, even these are these are like Aetna and MetLife, there was no negotiation. It was very much a take it or leave it. This is the license. You got to take you, you got to take the deal, and that's one of the reasons why the insurance industry was so involved in the fight against UCDA and base ultimately prevented from being adopted anywhere other than Maryland and and Virginia was because. They, there was no negotiation, even for, you know, these Fortune 50 companies. Mr. Bergmeier. Yeah, I just have a, <clears throat> just a sort of, sort of a clarification. Of some curious as to how uh, other people view this. I mean, when I read uh, the definition of a copy, it says it's a material object. So I would say that if I own the car. I necessarily own any copies of software in that car, unless you could say that there are physically parts of the car that I own and physically parts of the car that I don't own. Uh, because I can't sort of, I don't understand how you can read the statue in any other way. So if I own the car, I own the copies in the car. Or if I own the machine, I own the copies that are contained in the machine. Or if you say that I own the machine and I don't own the copies, there are physically parts, there are literally chips or portions of the physical item that I don't own while I do own the rest. And how do I pick out which ones I do and which ones I don't? I mean, this is just how the statute is written. This is the entire basis of how all of these interrelated statutes work. Uh, and I keep hearing this notion that, well, you own the machine, but you don't own copies of software on the machine. And that just doesn't make any sense, and it just doesn't comport with the statute. Uh, so, I mean, but what, so, I mean, do you think that Congress, when they, when Congress reacted to the M MAI case, do you think they were just, they were, they were, what do you think that, that meant? Were they not There's, implicitly sort of accepting that the, the, the premise of, you know, of, of, of Software ownership versus machine ownership was well, actually a real distinction, or what, what, it says how, that how if you, you own, react to that? I mean, I'm just looking at the statute, and it says if you own the machine, then if there is a new copy, in other words, something that does trigger copyright uh, that is made by virtue of activating the machine, then you are given a statutory license to make that copy. 
So that is not really relating to the nature of what a copy is or whether you own it or not. Uh, there's nothing in it that says you don't own the copy. It's authorizing you to make a new copy. Uh, so I think that's fine. And it does say a machine that, law that lawfully contains an, un an authorized copy. So that would seem to sort of say you could have a machine and parts of it count as the material object that is the copy and parts of it that don't. But if we're going to say that you don't own the copy but you do, but you do own the machine, then that necessarily requires that you have some way of determining which parts of the machine do I own and which parts of the machine don't I own. Because again, that's just what the statute says. There's no other way to read it that actually does justice to the actual words that Congress enacted. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I'm not going to have a, a lot to say about Section 117 based on my membership, of course, but I do want to make two points. The first is um, that there was another case that was decided the same day as Werner, and that's UMG v. Troy Augusto, which is a case of uh, distribution of um, uh, pro promotional CDs to radio stations via from from record labels and that that case was decided in favor of the of uh, in, in favor of the person who was doing the selling to my knowledge it has not affected a market for for c CDs so it, I, I and I offer that only because it seems relevant to me but I, I recognize that I'm a little bit off point here the other thing is I want to respond to a, some points that were made on this side of the table uh, re re regarding to with regard to piracy, and just to point out that uh, you know I, I have some experience with the concept of piracy. I've been accused at this table of being a pirate uh, in previous hearings, and I, I you know we 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 make laws for the 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 law abiding, not for the people that don't. If someone who's going to violate a license is going to violate the copyright, they don't care. The people who who this will affect are the people who do want to follow the law. So so uh, I I just like to remind people of that. That's probably all I'll say on this panel. Um, general question: uh, If Congress decided to enact Yoda or some other uh, legislation of a similar or different nature, or made uh, other changes that um, you know have been suggested here today, is there a risk or or a concern that Congress should be aware of that? that private parties would just simply contract around them, say, well, notwithstanding the, the provisions of the now newly amended 109 or 117, uh, you are not considered an owner. Um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to start to address that. As, as I recall, I don't have the text of Yoda memorized, but I do think that the bill uh, contemplates uh, the, the possibility of contracting around uh, those rights and it explicitly rejects that possibility. Um, so I think this is really important to go back to uh, the point that someone made earlier about the distinction between a contract and a license. Um, a license is fundamentally a creature of property law, not a creature of contract law. Um, and uh, you know, I, if what has happened is a transfer of ownership as a matter of property law, um, a contract doesn't change that. Right? It might create contract liability for breach, but I don't think it can change that fundamental question of the transfer of ownership. That's why I think it's really important that we have a clear, uh, uh, well-settled understanding of what kinds of property transactions uh, trigger a transfer of ownership. That's not a function of contract. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is, um, you know, on some of the earlier panels, we had some discussion uh, about, you know, concrete examples of uh, harm to consumers and whether we can uh, whether we can point to specific instances uh, w where uh, consumers have been prevented from transferring uh, their devices or whether we can articulate other kinds of harm um, and I think we can um, but I also think it's important to use the same standard in evaluating harm uh, when we're talking about these sort of uh, potential future harms to consumers, which I agree have not all materialized yet, and the kinds of speculative harms that have been articulated when it comes to passing legislation like Yoda. Right? I think we need to hold those two kinds of harm to the same standard. <laughs> 
So can I, can I ask you about sort of the Krauss test, which which starts from the premise that the the terms of the license are not necessarily controlling. They're relevant, but not necessarily controlling. And that, and at least in that case, the court kind of went beyond the four corners of the contract to look at the, kind of the the sort of facts on the ground to determine whether there was the the um, there was a license or there, whether there was ownership. I mean, do you think that that test is uh, sufficiently clear or, or is it sort of an appropriate approach for courts to take and try to draw this line? So I think the, I think the Krauss test by looking at the terms of the license um, is, is, is not mistaken, right, to take those terms into consideration. I think what's crucial, though, is trying to figure out exactly what question we're trying to answer. And the question we're trying to answer is not what are the hopes and dreams of the copyright holder that they have reflected in this agreement, which is, um, I think, what the Werner test does, right? It says, as long as you recite the right kinds of restrictions, as long as you announce your intention to restrict uh, use to restrict transfer, uh, and you call this thing a license and not a sale, uh, you get your wish. Um, of course, the context in which the transaction occurs is important. And some of that context is going to be reflected in the license. But we can't stop there, right? Um, my, uh, my beef with the Krauss decision um, is in part a, a question about uh, about terminology, right? I, I think this term licensed copy is, um, is misleading in an important way, right? It distracts our attention from what the, what the real question is, which is whether or not a transfer of ownership has occurred. Um, and I think the more familiar transactional categories are really much more useful than the term license in figuring out the answer to that question. Um, the statutory language, rental lease or lending, I think is much more effective because a license, as we know, this is one of the beauties of, of licenses, is that they are infinitely flexible, right? Um, property transactions are not infinitely flexible, certainly not property transactions when it comes to personal property. There's a limited number of accepted transactional forms, and what we have to do is look at a set of facts, including the text of the license uh, and decide which category works, right? The numerous clauses principle uh, applies in this context uh, as much as it does anywhere else uh, in, uh, in property law. Um, d does, that, does that get to, to your question? Yeah, I mean, I so uh, this is sort of, I'm trying to sort of see where, if there's any real disagreement between you and Mr. Moore in terms of, you know, Mr. Moore said it might be appropriate, it would be appropriate to look at Again, going back to the topic of the study, which which is software-enabled cons consumer products, which is it's, it may be a relevant consideration to look at whether what you're talking about is software that's embedded in a product when you're trying to determine, you know, under under a test like Krauss, whether something is owned or not. So I, I would I would not I, I don't think the question of ownership. Uh, hinges on whether the software is embedded in a device. I wasn't suggesting it was, but I was suggesting that it might be a relevant factor and it might mm -hmm. be an important factor. It, just going to the point that it gives you an indication of what the customs are, what the cu consumer expectations are, which is, I think, something Mr. Moore agreed would be a re also relevant. Yeah, I, I, I think it could be uh, a relevant factor. I don't think it's the driving factor. The, the things that I've talked about before, one-time payment, perpetual possession, I think, are much more clear, are, are much clearer indications of the answer to that question. But I think that context is important, and there might be reasons to treat uh, some kinds of products and some kinds of industries different from others. Thank you. So just to uh, take a, a jumping off point from what uh, Sai just said in the legislative legislation for uh, 117, that there's a carve out for uh, embedded software in, in devices in the context of rentals, the, the notion being that you can rent the car and you don't need to worry about the, the software in it. And in the legislative history, there's reference uh, as examples of such uh, devices as uh, microwave ovens. Um, 
And I, I guess you, you might look to that and say, well, Congress has sort of recognized that that's an issue and, and they've carved that out. And that would give us useful information about what has happened since, uh, since that change or that provision was added. Um, and I guess the question generally for the panel is, does that give us useful information from experience? Or is it the case that that change is really irrelevant because, again, getting back to the ownership question, if you don't own the software, you don't own the machine, it's, it's the, the, prov the provision is essentially doesn't do the work that, that it may have been intended to do. Mr. Band? Well, I think it's, it's, it's helpful <clears throat> in that it shows that, you know, at, at the time, uh, a certain industry group came forward, the rental car industry, and said, hey, this is a problem. And uh, Congress addressed that problem, and the sky didn't fall. Um, and uh, uh, we're now, you know, the economy is in a different place, and the, 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 the level of technology and the level of the, the number, the kinds of devices that have uh, software in them are, is different. And, and so, um, you know, I think it, it's certainly worth uh, looking at and saying, saying, well, that's a good starting point, but now, you know, that only applies to the rental of uh, uh, devices that have, or, you know, that have the software in it. And so it's worth saying, okay, can we, does it make sense to expand it beyond the rental context to uh, other contexts? And does it make sense to perhaps consider you know, expanding it to the the universe of software. I mean, you know, the the the, the definition that they have in, uh, uh, or, you know, the, the the category of software that applies to is kind of hard to understand exactly what it means, and you know, even with the report language, it's hard to understand. But I think it, it has been applied. Uh, people know. I think people basically understand what it's applied to, and it has not, as far as I'm aware, led to any litigation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's certainly worth saying, okay, this is a good starting point. You know, how, how, do we, how can we expand on that and how can we build on that uh, given the fact that the, uh, the world has moved forward from there and, and, uh, and the issue is far more pervasive in the economy than it was at the time? Mr. Kuberschmidt. So just to follow up on... Uh, your example of the microwave in the context of what Jonathan just said, I mean, they, the Congress knew microwaves had software back when they passed the, the act. Um, microwaves still have software in them. Not sure what in, in that context has changed. In other words, Congress understood the issue, they knew the issue, and decided to limit this carve out to rental. Um, and so I think until we have very sort of specific, concrete examples of problems, I think it would be a mistake to sort of legislate in this, in this arena. I'd also like to point out in the context of, the, of, of, of 109, I mean, we talk about licenses as if they were a four-letter word, um, and as if the mere fact that there's a license in place means that you can't do X, Y, and Z that you could do if you were an owner, and that simply isn't the case. It may be the case sometimes, but I think in the vast majority of examples, or at least I think we'd need to study of all the different consumer products that are out there, and that include software, to figure out how many of them actually do uh, restrict transfer. And of those products that restrict, restrict transfer, uh, how many of them just sort of condition transfer? Like, for instance, it allows you, there's a lot of software companies, for instance, that allow the transfer of their software, provided you let them know who you're transferring it to, um, and so they know who to give the updates to, or the, or the bug fixes, or, or, or what have you. And so I think what you'd see is, if you look at these licenses, that there are Number one, not those restrictions on things like, uh, you know, essential copies, not those restrictions on transfers that you think that, that people think they might be out there. And you might even find a lot of provisions in those licenses that provide benefits that are not found in an usual ownership or contract agreement. Mr. Moore. Uh, uh, just a, I guess a, a couple of points in light of the discussion that's gone on. Um, the the first thing is I, I I do see some overlap 
between um, Professor Persinowski and I, um, on the at least insofar as the concept of relevance goes. When, when the when we get to the concept of weight, I think we have probably considerably different views. Um, the, the second thing that struck me is um, in, in discussing the drafting of 117, I, I, like everybody else, I don't know how it got there. Um, I suspect um, Mr. Band is probably right. Um, and if he is right, uh, then the development of the licensing model for software uh, was part of congressional design. This was not an oversight. And so if we're doing that, I mean, again, I'm, this is, uh, the, the office is doing its job. If I'm coming back to the same points that I made in the beginning, we've been thoroughly uh, examining these issues. But um, again, there's an enormous record of success here in how that model has played out um, for software providers. Um, to that end, I guess I, I feel obligated to, uh, to voice um, extreme skepticism about the idea of any sort of preemption of of license terms. That's just not something that um, serves this industry well for a whole host of reasons. So there, there are some, there is at least one case, maybe more, that have actually preempted license terms in the copyright con context. Um, do you, oh, there's more than one. Yeah. Sure. So I mean, what do you think? I mean, what have the ill effects been of that of those? If you're saying there are certain cases, so uh, under the there, are, there. Well, there's a couple different kinds of preemptions. Um, there's, there's statutory, um, right? And then you have field and conflict. I, I'm assuming you're talking about statutory preemption cases? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the, with respect to the statutory preemption cases, um, there is a dividing line um, that we have historically not really had a problem with between, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the exact words, but essentially it's a qualitative test that the courts have applied. Um, and there's a difference, for example, between use restrictions and copying restrictions. And if you have copying restrictions, then the court looks at those particular cases askance. And if you have use restrictions, then they don't. Um, that's an appropriate and workable line. That's a quite different matter um, from, a, from a statute that preempts contracts or a specific type of contract for a particular industry. It's very, very different. So we're OK. I mean, we're OK with existing law. We don't have a problem with it. but when we're talking about, in this discussion, moving beyond that, um, that's where the, the, the hackles start to go up. Mr. Zuck. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks again for allowing me to be part of this conversation. And it's very interesting to find the intersections between sort of the practical implications and some of these deep dives into the legal um, discussions. And so, Taking a step back again, I guess I want to reiterate what Chris said, which is that we have a system that's largely working in terms of software licensing and in terms of serving the needs of the majority of consumers, right? In other words, most consumers have a particular mode of operation and, and don't have assumptions about um, if I buy an app on my phone, that, that that app will transfer with the phone if I give the phone to someone else, for example. And so it ends up being exception cases that I feel like we're talking about a lot. And and so, so when trying to address those exception cases, I think it has to be weighed against the success of the industry to date and, and also some of the flexibility and, again, the dynamism associated with those licensing practices. So, I mean, when I um, sell a piece of software, um, uh, a game or something like that, that uh, for 99 cents, I do it with the expectation that you will probably tire of that game eventually. So the point at which you've tired of that game is what I consider to be the duration of the life cycle of that game. It's not um, how long somebody, an indefinite number of people, could be interested into that game into the future, right? I mean, it's so when I'm pricing at 99 cents, I'm sort of building into that notion that, well, after six months, you're going to either stop playing this or you're going to buy new levels or something like that. I'm not building into a 99% cost the ability for an infinite number of people to become bored with that game. And so there's this, so there, there is some expectation in some of these dynamic licensing models that says that I understand how users are going to go about using it. Um, and then, you know, again, in the context of embedded devices, which is where we have the least amount of information about this, I think, because there's the least amount of, of, of uh, 
licensing cases that have been addressed and, and, and situations. But if I say just automatically that if you buy a refrigerator, you own all the software in the refrigerator, does that mean that I can carry that software into another refrigerator, for example, that I buy? Or does the lifetime of the software uh, die with the refrigerator? Well, if I own the software, then why don't I have the ability to transfer that to another refrigerator that I want to use instead, but with this software that I somehow own as a result of purchasing a refrigerator? So I can see a lot of It's not, it's not particularly situations. realistic for a consumer. Well, no, it's, well, not particularly realistic for a consumer, but that's just it. Most of these cases that we're talking about aren't consumer cases. They are about very large industries that are trying to commoditize add-on products, aftermarkets, et cetera. It's very seldom about a consumer doing any of these things. So in that case, Case, I could very much see a situation where I could take advantage of ownership law, provide some way that here's my new refrigerator that's half price, and here's a way to transfer the software out of this uh, you know, refrigerator you owned before, and you don't have to buy another one or something like that. That could be done at, an, at, a, at, a, at a higher level than just an individual consumer and made pretty easy, I guess. I mean, I'm, you know, I, it's a weird example of the refrigerator because it's such a big device, but I mean, it certainly could have been the case with TiVos or something like that, that where a lot of that kind of active uh, hacking took place even at a consumer level. So I mean, I, again, ownership of the software, I think, has downstream consequences that we aren't, that haven't fully thought through, that's all, even in embedded devices. So, thank you for Bunker. bringing that one up, Mr. Zuck. So, uh, maybe we can put a, a, a more realistic face on it when we talk about exchanging software on parts in automobiles. And so in this example where you know somebody owns the copy of the software on their automobile and one of the, the parts malfunctions, but there's a piece of software on that part, right? And we'll imagine that it's, it's just a, a part that's not covered by copyright so, or covered by patent. So it's just a screw that has a piece of software in it that communicates with another screw just to say, this is the correct approved screw that contains, you know, the, that's authorized by the automobile manufacturer. Well, you know, if the software is not there, an aftermarket parts manufacturer can come in and say, I, I, I can make that screw, let me put that screw in, you have several options. But in the scenario where, um, you know, the, it, the owner of the automobile does not own the software and does not have the right to transfer the copy of the software into the new screw, now they don't have options for replacement screws. They have to go to the person who owns the copyright in the software in the screw. And it's not, you know, you say maybe in the refrigerator market, you know, this, this is sort of unrealistic and it's impractical, impractical to think about this, but, you know, the aftermarket auto part industry is a $350 billion industry. I mean, this is something that exists and that's changing because, you know, of the prevalence of software in these, that, that is, purely mechanistic in parts. So I think it's a very real concern. And, and I, th I think that a lot of that's going to get adjudicated uh, over time, and we've seen already cases where pure interoperability uh, has fallen in favor of of, of even replacement printer cartridges and things like that. That So I, I think the systems that are in place are addressing those issues. I, I'm, let me think of another example that uh, cameras, right? I'm a photographer. If I buy the Canon 5D uh, Mark II, it has a certain amount of firmware on it that provides a certain functionality. There's other cameras uh, that they sell. The only difference of them is, in fact, the firmware, right? And that there's prov additional functionality provided to the owners of those cameras, and the difference between them is, in fact, the software and not the hardware, because it's simply easier to fully implement it and to provide uh, different firmware than it is to have different manufacturing practices. So if I own the firmware associated with a more expensive camera, can I then later upgrade to a cheaper camera and install the firmware from the previous one? I would consider that to be a bad um, you know, potential, and yet firmware is something that's completely transferable and is done by uh, users today, right? So it's not... It's not unimaginable, right? And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just, if we're having a, a theoretical discussion about it, I can come up with as many theories why I don't want that transferability as you can come up with it do. I guess my understanding of what has happened historically, though, is that the things on which we would all kind of agree would be a good idea, the courts have ended up ruling in that direction. Mr. Bergmeier. All the examples you're bringing up are not transfers of material items. They're all about making new copies. They're all about making adaptations. They're all about things that really don't relate to whether or not you own the copy. Owning a copy of a, so a 99 cent software app 
would only mean that you could transfer your phone, your physical phone. It doesn't give you the magical right to make an infinite number of new copies to anyone else who wants one. If I own a refrigerator, that doesn't give me the right to transfer the software because it would give me the right to move the chips from one refrigerator to another, sure, but not to make a new copy. And the same thing with the firmware. So I think there's just a failure to distinguish between ownership of a copy, which is a material thing, and then the uh, implication of actual uh, copyright rights under such as reproduction or or derivative works and if those are allowed those would be allowed under fair use or maybe they are allowed under some other doctrine but whether or not you own the copy it really has no bearing owning the copy just means that you own the physical thing and that's it and it means that you can move that physical thing around and resell that physical thing it's not about giving you IP rights of any sort On the flip side of that, though, if I license uh, software, for example, and I, and again, this isn't embedded, but I, where these are the examples that I'm drawing from, I, I have the ability to install it onto a new device, for example. So if I'm only confined to my ownership of the copy that exists on a single device, and I then sell that device and get a new, the new iPhone or something like that, that would suggest that I don't then have a right to bring a new copy of software onto that device. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. If I buy software, if I buy physical, if I buy optical media, then I'm given an essential you're, you're, step. None of it's optical. You're downloading it from a store to your phone. Yes. So you're saying that that's the thing that you want to own. Okay. Yes, I'm I own say, my phone. Okay. I already so, owned my phone. So you and I own no, it after installing software. But you want to own that software. It. Yes. That you've downloaded. Okay. I own then the fine. Then when you get a new phone, then you have to pay me to get the software again for the new phone. Is what you're suggesting. There are markets that work that way, and there are markets that don't. I mean, there are markets that give you unlimited re-downloads onto new physical devices and that you own. because it's a license. Tied. Right. So what I bought then is I bought the right to you make don't, you new bought reproductions. Nothing. That's the point. You, 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 yes, but, you bought uh, a license of the, the software. Phone. So that regardless, sometimes you can use okay. it on three different devices, for if example. If I own my phone, I own a copy of the software that is installed on that phone because a copy is defined in the statute as a material item. There is no other category. There is no ethereal copy, like right to own a copy, right to make a new copy. I can license IP rights or I can own a physical item. And, you, and there's just a continual failure to make that distinction, which is vital in specifically the embedded software context that we're here to discuss because it specifically implicates the ability to transfer devices with software that is embedded in them from one person to another. I, I, I guess... There hasn't been that problem, that much problem doing those transfers of devices that have embedded software, though. I think we would say that in the automotive industry, there are, there have been those issues. So we, we you're talking we about see replacement parts, though. It's a different right, issue there, than transferring. But there are part. So this gets to what John was saying earlier about how when you own the automobile, you know, are we going to distinguish between whether you own certain parts and don't own others? What we're saying is when you're replacing a part, the you know. There are restrictions that are, are not allowing you to transfer the chip that contains the software to the other because you can't access it and you can't get it to reboot on the other, on the replacement device. Is it about you transferring a chip or building your own chip into your, the new screw that you're trying to provide, the new function you're trying to provide? Is it really about making a physical transfer of a chip from one screw to another that you're trying to it's both accomplish? Issues. It's both issues. I mean, I, I would just say I'm actually adopting what I think is a pretty narrow view of 109 because I am specifically not saying that this is about digital first sale, which is some, some right which people have proposed to, yeah, to make new copies. This is about transferring a material item from one owner to another, and that's it. There are other issues that are related to digital first sale that we can discuss, but specifically when it comes to Section 109 and the ownership of a copy, it is only about the, the ownership of a material item. It is not about IP rights, and it is not about anything sort of broader than that. And I think it is uh, simply misleading to suggest that, saying that the fact that someone owns a copy gives them intellectual property rights, uh, which would be a license that they otherwise don't have. Okay, uh, I wanted to hit one other topic uh, before we um, close out, and that's uh, open source uh, software, uh, which is often accompanied by conditions on the free transfer and reproduction of such software, such as requiring the disclosure of any software modifications 
or the downstream licensing of such software. And the question I'd like to, uh, to put out is, would Yoda or an amendment like Yoda affect the development and use of open source software? Chris? Um, so, yeah, sorry, again. Uh, so this question came up before, and the answer to that question is yes. Um, and the reason is because an owner of a copy, if I make a, mo a modification, suppose it's a fair use. I have no obligation whatsoever to share that. I may, in fact, sell fair uses of particular works without permission. That's the point, right? So <laughs> under that type of model, um, that's undercuts, that type of model rather, undercuts the uh, incentives for communities to develop around open source and the sharing that goes on in those communities to quickly fix bugs and so on and so forth. It's a very different way of um, distributing software. And the current model allows people to choose. If they think that they're going to do better under an open source model, they are free to do so and to adopt any number of different licenses, whether it's the GPL or another one. Um, and if they want to do a closed ecosystem in the way that Apple does, they can do that too. That's fine. Um, and it seems to have worked pretty well. Um, the, the only way it doesn't work, I guess, is if, is if you um, are adopting, and I mean, I, I don't know what more I can say um, about differing ways of construing the statute vis-a-vis -vis ownership and copy um, other than uh, if, if you don't, uh, other than to really say I don't agree, um, I'm having trouble finding a court case that agrees. Um, and there are lots of people who have invested lots of time, money, and effort on particular constructions of that very provision um, that has been shown to be an enormous success. I think it would be um, unwise to disrupt those expectations or that performance. Mr. Band. Yeah, I, I don't see uh, Yoda or, or, or something like that having any imp impact at all on <clears throat> open source software, as we, as we heard before. Uh, uh, you know the, the open source licenses are affecting the 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 rights attaching to the the software, but not the copy of the software, uh, because it's 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 uh, um, and and so uh, you know the, the open source license allows the second user to make copies or to make derivative works. Um, those are completely different from what we're talking about in Yoda, which is purely about can the first person sell the product to the second person. Um, and and uh, it, it doesn't, and it would no way limit what's, how the, how the, the open source model would work. Um, but also just getting back to the, 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 the previous colloquy be, uh, about, um, you know, let's say firmware that is transferred from one device to a newer device. Uh, I mean, you, you see that all the time with refurbished products. And, um, you know, w we think that that secondary market for refurbished products is, I mean, that's a good thing. It's, it's, it's positive for uh, uh, consumers because, you know, you, you have consumers who are able to buy products at a lower cost than they would have been able to buy uh, a, a new or unrefurbished product. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, you know, environmentally good to recycle products. Um, and uh, you know, so, so yes, it means it conceivably means that you, you'll have a manufacturer who would have to compete with a refurbished product. Um, but you know, we think that competition is good. Uh, basically, that 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 uh, and copyright and other statutory monopolies are the exception to the general rule in our economy that we want to promote competition. And so. Uh, having refurbished products is, is a good thing, and we should encourage it uh, 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 as much as possible. Mr. Berzanowski. So I want to go back to, uh, to go back a few minutes to uh, a point that was made uh, about the possibility that at least some uh, license agreements uh, grant consumers certain rights that might otherwise uh, uh, be within their control as owners of copies. Um, there are circumstances, right, where uh, a license does provide something akin to the rights under 109 or 117, right? That happens out in the world sometimes. Um, and 
you know, I think that those kinds of flexible licenses um, uh, are a welcome addition to what we see out out there uh, in the market. You know, so Amazon, for example, has um, a sort of simulation of lending that works on the Kindle. So publishers can opt in for some books to allow uh, consumers to lend uh, an ebook one time uh, for a period of two weeks and then never again, right? And so there are, I think, two important limitations to keep in mind uh, and, and I think demonstrate why those kinds of licensed secondary markets are a pretty poor substitute for the real thing. Um, one is they're incomplete, right? Amazon system, for example, is opt-in. Um, not all platforms do this, certainly not all publishers participate, so you get this sort of spotty uh, set of rights for consumers. And the other, I think, more important big picture thing is there's a big difference between granted permission to engage in a behavior and having a right to engage in that behavior, right? Property is not having to ask for permission. Right? That's why we care about ownership. And there are some really important things that flow from unregulated property interests, right? Unregulated uh, secondary markets. We might think that those uses are most valuable precisely where permission is not going to be granted, right? Um, so you know you 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 mentioned that you know sometimes they say look yeah you can sell your software but like you know write down who you're selling it to and keep track of of that transfer well you know one of the great things that comes from unregulated unlicensed secondary markets is privacy no one keeps track of who owns what no one keeps track of what books you're reading no one keeps track of what software you're using and I think consumers see that as a benefit. Um, you know, you can think about user innovation um, or, you know, potentially competitive uh, uses that um, or, you know, competitive resale markets where uh, it's really unlikely that anybody is going to give uh, permission for someone to take their product and build on it and do something new and interesting with it, um, where you might not see permission uh, to sell a used product at a lower price that competes uh, with the new product. But that's precisely what a property interest allows owners to do. So those things do exist, uh, but they, they are not a perfect substitute for, uh, for actual ownership by, uh, by purchasers. Uh, Chris, uh, Mr. Moore, would you have one more, one final thought of Mr. Happerson? Uh, no. It, it's Mr. Kind of, Sorry, go ahead. It, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not going to be the final word because that would be kind of silly. But I promised I would shut up, and I did not sign a contract to that effect, so you're stuck with one more a word. I want to just um, go back to a couple of things that were said earlier. Um, we, th there, there's been a lot of talk, or some talk anyway, about un unintended consequences. Of, of changing the law. W the Mu Music Library Association is here pr precisely because we're worried about unintended consequences of, t of looking at something too narrowly and having that have broader consequences. So, so just to, 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 to be clear, w unless the, w what, what is, is recommended is something narrow to the extent of only affecting 109 C, for example, um, and the way, again, that, that legislation works, I think that's unlikely. Making a ch change in this small field will have larger ripple effects. So please, I, 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 I implore the office to consider the wider impact of what they're recommending. The other thing I want to, to address is, is the, the question of preemption of contracts and and the reason I want to do that is because we are we, we do propose a, 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 a form of that but I want to be clear that we do not support for example what was done in the United Kingdom which renders certain contracts unenforceable if they if they contradict uh, limitations and exceptions in their law that would cause enormous problems for us uh, in, in negotiations of gift agreements and the like um, the, what we are requesting is is um, is a much narrower f form of preemption, and I, I would like to just underline uh, 
that proposal. It's in our initial comments, and so I just would like to point towards that. And Mr. Cooperschmidt, you get the last word. Okay. Um, so just to point out a sort of an inconsistency with, with at least what I'm hearing from, I'll say, the other side of the table, um, we hear that, um, that consumers have a right to privacy. I understand that. I, I, I get that. We're also hearing that, you know, they should have a right to uh, updates and bug fixes and customer support, as would be in the Yoda bill. You can't have it both ways. I mean, there's no way for the software company to know who am I, uh, th know that the, that the software has been transferred and to know who to provide these updates and bug fixes and customer support to if the individual wishes to be re remain anonymous or something in terms of who you sell to. So there's, a, there's an internal inconsistency there um, that is, uh, you know, that, that is problematic. And I think from a consumer protection or uh, from, you know, sort of satisfying their customer base, I think it makes a lot of sense for these software companies to include a provision in there that says, yes, you can transfer. We're giving you, that's what you want to do. Yes, you can transfer the software, but under these circumstances, which is we need to know who you're transferring it to so we know who to deliver the customer support to, the upgrades, the bug fixes. I, I, I think that's completely reasonable, and and to the extent we're hearing otherwise, it's sort of putting the software companies in a in a no-win situation, and 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 uh, and I guess that's the last word. Thank you to the members of our panel. This concludes our roundtable on software-enabled consumer products. Uh, oh, excuse me, I'm being corrected on that. <laughs> Um, so uh, we have a microphone set up, a freestanding microphone. Uh, we wanted to have sort of a period of time for uh, observers in the audience to offer any thoughts or comments they might have. So um, there's a mic stand that's making its way to the, f to the front of the room. Um, so if, anyone, if anyone's interested, uh, go ahead. We, there's a microphone there. Uh, Mr. Tepp. Thanks. I Is this on? Is it on? No, there we go. All right. Uh, just a, a couple of remarks in regard to the harm from the proposed contract preemption concept. I'd like to point out that commonly in the business to business context, licenses are the result of face to face, arm length negotiations, and that preemption of those contracts introduces unnecessary uncertainty into the marketplace and is inconsistent with the basic free market approach of the U.S. copyright system dating all the way back to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. In any event, uh, what this issue really boils down to is preempting contract terms that some people don't like, notwithstanding the fact that they're enforceable contract terms. Uh, so it's about government banning certain business models, which will actually have the predictable effect of increasing prices because software companies have fewer options in how to tailor a license to particular uses, and they'll be forced to offer higher level, higher price licenses. Um, and the case for government control in place of free market approach simply hasn't been made. The, the evidence is scant at best. Um, particularly in the context of the software industry, which is as dynamic, as competitive, and as innovative as any industry in the United States. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the audience? Okay. Well, um, thank you. That was uh, the, now it's the end of the uh, first round table <laughs> on software-enabled consumer products, and uh, next week in San Francisco. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.